Our man with the hat's making an early start and he's off again on one of his sentimental journeys. This time to the St Paul's Church Kindergarten in Upper Rangoon Road. His very first institute of education and somewhere amongst this lot is possibly the young Julian Davison. However, it's difficult to pick him without his hat. The front of the building remains much as it was in Julian's day, with the addition of a rather splendid painting. And the chatter of cheerful children inside is exactly as it always was. Well, I haven't been here for 40 years, or more, in fact. But you know, things are pretty much the same. Doors on either side, lots of fresh air, a bit more colourful. In those days, my teachers seemed to have colourful names as well. A Miss Brown and a Miss Green. There might even have been a Miss Blue. I learned my numbers using an abacus at the front of the class. I remember that. <laughs> it's really quite incredible to be here, I tell you. <laughs> now, I remember on my first day of school, my mother gave me a toffee as a sort of kind of inducement to come to school in the first place. I think I cried. I also remember this place as being the size of a football pitch. But I see that in reality, it's more like a badminton court. It's funny how things seem much bigger as a child. Now that I'm an adult and all grown up, I've come to realize that some places really are much bigger. No trick of childhood memory. Just opposite me, where Raffles City now stands, was once the site of Raffles Institution. Now you may recall that we visited Raffles Institution in our previous series, but it's well worth going there again to learn a little bit about how it came into being. Although Sir Stanford Raffles' own education was largely self-taught, he was very keen that others should enjoy the benefits of a good schooling. And one of his last public acts before leaving Singapore in 1823 was to found the Singapore Institution. This was intended as a kind of Malay college which would bring learning to the peoples of the region. And a site was chosen for the institution down on Beach Road, not a stone's throw from the sea. Let us not be remembered as the tempest whose course was desolation, said the great man, but as the gales of spring. Though this early painting of the Singapore Institution is quite flattering, the fact of the matter was that the building was poorly constructed and fell quickly into disrepair. Architect George Coleman came to the rescue and did an excellent job of putting things right. So by 1840, what was now known as the Raffles Institution was a fully functional school. By the 1900s, it no longer took in primary school students and had become purely a secondary school, and a most prestigious one at that. It built a reputation for scholastic excellence that is still enjoyed by the Raffles Institution today. Pretty spartan interior for such a prestigious establishment. Obviously they spent the money on the education. In the spacious school grounds, students also regularly displayed athletic as well as academic prowess. The prime land occupied by the institution was eventually deemed a little too valuable for educational purposes, and thus time ran out for the brainchild of Sir Stamford Raffles. The students were assembled and their band played a final farewell on the historical site. The last day. In early 1972, it was all over for the original Raffles Institution. And the demolition of the school buildings took place with brisk efficiency. There had been many who had lobbied for the preservation of Raffles Institution, but alas, in vain. One hopes a Raffles old boy might have quietly removed an historical brick or two that might now take place in a personal collection of nostalgia. By 1980, the site of the Raffles Institution and its grounds had become an immense hole and was being prepared to accommodate the bulk and weight of the massive Raffles City Complex. 
Sadly, all too many beautiful old school buildings have suffered the same fate as Raffles Institution. But fortunately, the uh, former University of Malaya here at Bukit Timah has so far been spared. And certainly, it's a historical site that's well worth preserving. It may not look all that remarkable right now, but it's actually a very fine piece of architecture from the 1960s. And if it were to go in 50 years' time, we'd be very sorry that it did. Now here's something interesting, because as far as I'm aware, this is the only building that was built by the Japanese during the occupation. In the war, the Japanese took over the University of Malaya and they used it as an administrative headquarters. And to give them credit, they tried to mimic, as far as possible, the architecture of the existing buildings on campus at that time. The tall building behind the old Japanese headquarters was a later addition, but it nevertheless contains a novel and necessary feature that's worth a quick look. Now back in the late 50s when this building was designed, things like service lifts weren't such an integral part of the fabric of a building as they are today. And so the architects came up with quite a nifty solution for getting large and heavy items of furniture up to the top floor here. Now you'll see there's quite a considerable gap between the two staircases and there's a void all the way down to the ground floor. And then if you look up there, there's a kind of gantry affair and on the end there, a donkey engine which could come out over the void, drop a line and a hook, picks up the furniture and up she comes. Voila, quite a neat little solution. The Strait Settlements government donated land at Bukatima to build Raffles College. And though it was intended as a memorial to celebrate Singapore's centenary, it wasn't to open until nine years later, in 1928. It was combined with the King Edward VII College of Medicine to form the University of Malaya in 1949. It became the University of Singapore until the university moved on, eventually to its present site at Kent Ridge in 1977. Now here I am at the core of the original 1929 campus with these magnificent buildings named after famous benefactors, Manasseh Mayer, Yi Tong Seng, arranged around a large open space, the Quadrangle. Now the Quadrangle is a key element in the architectures of schools and universities in England, most famously in the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. They're pretty venerable institutions, but in fact the idea goes back far further in time than that to the monasteries and cathedrals of the early medieval period, which were similarly laid out around a large open space with covered walkways on either side, the cloisters. So here I am, University of Malaya, 1929. But the actual concept of all of this goes back to the 12th or 13th century. Pretty fantastic. The old University of Malaya campus was taken over by the National Institute of Education and then became the Singapore Management University. It's hoped that when the SMU moves out in 2005, this beautiful and historical site will continue to be used as an educational establishment, the function for which it had been originally designed. After the break, we're going to take a look at old school sites. The pupils and teachers have moved out, but the bulldozers haven't moved in. So stick around and I'll be back. It can't be said that the old Telok Kurau Primary School was ever exactly an architectural masterpiece, but it's still worth a visit to see what became of it. And that is the Telok Kurau Studios, a workplace to some of Singapore's leading artists and sculptors. Now, a very delightful friend of mine, Tio Eng Seng, has kindly offered to show me around and to introduce me to a few people and see what goes on in here. Let me take you to see uh, some of the artists in uh, the studio here. Right, OK. Oh, good, well, good, good. I'm, this is an interesting place. This is a recycled school, and we're going to meet some of the people who are now in residence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's start with uh, you know, our veteran artist here. Mr. Good morning. Uh, Chu Shui Fook, huh? right. very important man who is probably the man here every day. Really? Chu Shui Fook. Oh, what a, yeah. what a fantastic studio you have. Nice Hello, to you. nice to meet you, yeah. Gosh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So you've got lots of things for you to see. Yeah, well, a, a man of many talents, painting, sculpture, application, yeah. yeah. Cranky. Now we look at our famous Anthony Poon. Hello, Anthony. Hello. 
Hi, no oh, hello. Come in. Good. Come on, Julian, yeah, Julian David. Julian, 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 huh? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Man with lots of public commission in Singapore, right. all yeah. over yeah. the place. Each artist has their own uh, studio, which was a former classroom. Mm -hmm. So it's very good use of space. So it's so hard to come by for artists in modern Singapore. Imagine trying to paint in an HDB. At the stream, Leon Hart. Yeah, look, this oh, is a very interesting studio. Good morning to you, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, yeah. The stream, Leon Hart was trained in, was in Paris. Trained in Paris. Really? Really, my God. Yeah. 19, in 1972 to 1982. I'm uh, astonished by your, uh, by your sailing ship. <laughs> really uh, staggering. <laughs> so, this is what can become of schools when they've passed their sell-by date when it comes to educating uh, children. It can come to be a wonderful space for artists to work in. Should be more of this. Hey. How many um, uh, artists are there in, in total? In, 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 in... 30 artists right. and two art societies. Brilliant. One yeah. Singapore Colour Photographic Society. Oh yes. And the other one is the Watercolour Society. Great, right? Yeah. Okay. So Amanda's obviously a keen horticulturalist. Amanda! Hello! Alright. Now this is the uh, studio of Amanda Heng. The resident artists are pleased that their stay here at Telokura has been extended recently, for there had been talk of shifting them all elsewhere. An unwelcome move that's fortunately been forestalled, at least for the immediate future. Oh, so La was here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and before La Salle's go out, what Telokura Primary School South. I see, yeah. okay. And yeah. How, how long was uh, La Salle here? Uh, La Salle was here, I think, for about five years. I, I, it was just my guess, yeah. about five years or a bit more, yeah. And this used to be the workshop, you see, so we have converted it into an art gallery, yeah. So uh, here you see some exhibits. These are all artists, um, artists, artists who are residents yeah. here, yeah. This space is also well used, you know, because it, it was an air well. Oh, so really? We put a roof over it yeah. and we got a nice workshop, yes. right? And uh, right ah, now, right yeah. now, right now, I'm doing a uh, doing works by the meters. I sell you, I sell you work by the meters. <laughs> <laughs> this is all together 83 feet. It's by the meter, huh? So there you are. <laughs> see, so you, you see the contrast sometimes. The creative folk who work at Telok Karat Studios find it extremely conducive towards the pursuit of their artistic activities. It's spacious and it's quiet and it's a friendly sort of place. But perhaps best of all, it's far away from the hustle and bustle of the city. As it happens, we're not too far away from a couple of other schools which have been modified and put to good use. So let's go and take a look at them, shall we? As Tio Eng Seng mentioned, the La Salle College of the Arts had a brief period of occupancy at Talo Kural, specifically their School of Design. It moved to the Goodman Road Secondary School in 1995, where it united all its diverse activities on this single campus. By then, it also took on a new name, the La Salle SIA College of the Arts, in recognition of generous support from Singapore Airlines. A year after La Salle SIA settled in its new home, the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts leased the former school premises of St. Anthony's Convent in Middle Road, assisted by sponsorship from the National Arts Council as part of its arts housing initiative. The Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts was begun in the early 1930s by a group of wealthy Chinese businessmen from Fuzian province and their original intention for their educational institution had nothing to do with art. In view of the fact that Singapore was an island, they saw the sea as a vital part of its future, and their plan was to set up a seafood specialist school. Fortunately, preferences turned to the establishment instead of a fine arts school, and it opened in 1938 in Geelong the first of many sites it was to occupy before making St. Anthony's Convent School one of them. There's a sprinkling of dusty colonial statues lurking about the building, which don't seem at all sure why they're there. Their fate, and that of the entire St. Anthony's Convent School, is at present a little uncertain, 
because Nafa has moved out into new premises. Hopefully, St. Anthony's will remain on the list of school survivors, amongst which is the Taonan School in Armenian Street, today the Asian Civilizations Museum. The Taonan School here in Armenian Street was founded in 1906 by the Hokkien Clan Association of Singapore with the purpose of preserving and promoting the cultural heritage of mainland China. When the school moved to these premises in 1911, it coincided with the revolution in China. And the school was the first in Singapore to adopt Mandarin as its principal language of instruction. Before that, children were taught in dialect. After the break, we're going to pop around the corner and take a look at what's going on in another museum, a much older institution, which I'm reliably informed has a haunted staircase. So you don't want to miss out on that one. Education doesn't come to a grinding halt when school days are over, but continues on throughout adult life in many and varied forms. And the Singapore History Museum is a pleasurable part of the ongoing learning process. It closed in 2003 for extensions and renovations, but not before Julian found time to pay it a final visit. In a year or so, it'll reopen, bigger and better with modern display areas added to the rear. And as can be seen, the integrity of the original old museum building will be perfectly maintained. It's been over a year since Julian's last visit, and he's back to check out progress. We have completely stripped the old museum displays yeah, yeah. and basically exposed all the original um, mouldings yes. and uh, this architecture. Uh, and yeah, this is a unique feature of this room. It's the only room we've had uh, cast iron columns in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what are we looking at here, Kenneth? Uh, this is actually a pit which we dug up to expose the foundations as right. part of our investigation work yeah. into the original structural system of the building. Yeah. Um, what we discovered is uh, the building is actually being founded on bricks where the, the concrete slab is sitting on. Hey, can, we, can we have a look at your, uh, your plans here because I think that probably shows, uh, right, I mean you can see how um, everything sort of fits in within the grid system which was probably devised by the original architect right. who would have been from the PWD. Right, that's right. When renovations are completed, yeah. this particular space will take on a new role as part of the redesign of the museum. It will no longer be a display room and instead food will be the feature. Yeah, this being a restaurant, um, the windows, the concept of the new uh, museum would be a very open and inviting. Uh, so all the shutters will be open. The room, of course, will be air-conditioned. Right. But uh, it will be a very open and uh, inviting area yeah. with all the glass windows, shutters right. open. The renovation of the museum provides Julian with an opportunity to visit a quiet corner, not generally open to the public. A cast iron spiral staircase, reputedly haunted. Precisely why it's haunted, we haven't been able to learn, but the story persists nevertheless. Possibly some unfortunate individual in the dim and distant past took a tumble from the top, something our man with a hat has studiously avoided. Museum mysteries aren't entirely over. Workmen on the site often report hearing and sometimes glimpsing children laughing and playing in this area behind the old building. Hardly sinister, but certainly difficult to explain. So Julian is extra careful when descending the spiral staircase. Somewhere brighter and cheerier might well be a good idea. Ah, oh, now this is pretty much how I remember things from when I was a boy. Of course, in those days, there was no air conditioning, so all the windows were open just like they are right now. And this wonderful light streaming into this beautiful room with its gorgeous uh, decorated ceiling. 
And in those days, the upper story was given over to the Raffles Natural History Collection. So it was full of glass cases of bugs and beetles with the odd stuffed orangutan going quietly bald in the corner of the room. And on this end wall, I remember there was a huge stingray, vast, the size of a dinner table. It was really quite spectacular. Another fabulous space. You know, these rooms are so beautifully proportioned and such lovely detailing, it seems almost a shame to fill them up with exhibits. They're perfect, just as they are. Right next door to the History Museum, the National Library is about to be upgraded too, however, in a far more draconian manner. Work's been going on down in Middle Road for quite some time on the construction of a new National Library, due to be completed in 2005. More space for more books is the upside of a library some 20 times bigger than its predecessor. The downside is that the old National Library will be no more, and a spin through its shelves is about to become but a pleasant memory. a dollar for every hour I've spent reading in there, I could happily retire a wealthy man. But not being a wealthy man, I shall repair instead to the delightful S11 over there for what I know to be the best iced lemon tea in town. So while I go in order, why don't you check out in next week's programme? Our man with the hat's boarding a boat for a magical mystery tour. The last wild place to change its face is all about what's going on at Pulau Ubin and what used to go on there. If elephants, tigers and Japanese soldiers can visit the island, then why not Julian? Bring a pair of sturdy shoes, your designer water bottle and plenty of mosquito repellent and join Jungle Julian next week on Sight and Sound. I rather fear that the Singapore Management University across the road over there has its eye on this place which is rather alarming because S11 is very much the last of its breed along Orchard Road and Bras Bazaar. And it's really a shame that just one old style, open air, rustic eatery can't be allowed to remain to amuse tourists and people such as myself who just like this kind of place. Alas, progress would seem to have it otherwise. It may be no centre of higher education, but S11 does have a thing or two it could teach other such establishments. Not least, how to make a really decent iced lemon tea. So until next week, your very good health. Are you ready? The, the gentleman from the end has come. <laughs> if I had an hour, what am I saying? What am I saying? <laughs> so really are much bigger. No trick of memory. Get it. Good. When I go in order, check out what's on store. In store, on store. I'll stop laughing at my own jokes. <laughs>